Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Matt Michelson and Calvin Bone. Matt and Calvin are co-founders at Smalls, where they're taking a fresh look at feeding felines. After seeing just how many cats are overweight, suffering from renal failure or urinary crystals, they realized just how big a difference real food could make for all cats. So I want to welcome both Matt and Calvin to the show. Thanks for having us on, Stacey. Let's start with Matt. Matt, how'd you get interested in cats, food, felines? You know, tell me your story. Yeah, for sure. I grew up with cats and dogs. I had a cat named Kiki growing up. And we were always just a little bit suspicious about the food. You open up a bag of dry food and it just doesn't quite smell like food. And so always just had a hankering suspicion about what was going on there and, and what was happening. Actually, Kiki was only with us for a handful of years. I lived near Forest Park, which is a really big state park in Portland, Oregon. And uh, actually a coyote got a hold of her. So had a cat growing up and then haven't had a cat again until recently and fostering a cat from an organization called Brooklyn Street Cats, Bushwick Street Cats, I'm sorry. And so yeah, now have a, have a cat again with Clayton and you know, really working on trying to get to the bottom of what's going on in pet food and the pet food industry and, and sort of see if we can improve the health of felines with, with better food. And so, Matt, you are like the, the master business person for Smalls. And uh, Calvin, I promoted you as the, the head chef for the organization. So, Calvin, tell us how you got interested in, in food and, and felines. Absolutely. So my interest in food started with human food which is a good place to start because one of the big lessons that we think we really want cat owners to sort of wrap their heads around is that the same intuitive truths that are true for human food are true for cat food, dog food, etc. What you eat has a major impact on your energy, your long-term health, and your day-to-day health and wellness. And we've really seen, thankfully, over the last few years um, in human food, a revolution towards better eating and the big thing that we really hope we can do as a business is bring that same mentality to pet food, specifically cats. We got interested in the industry and finding out why cats need better things when we started looking at obesity statistics and learning about healthcare costs. Increasingly over time, cats are even more obese than humans. Right now, 58% of cats are overweight, 28% of those are obese, or pardon me, 28% of the overall population. And that's up 7% from just 2011. So we're seeing massive uh, expansions in obesity. We're seeing healthcare costs for cats expanding and, and increasing even faster than human healthcare costs in the US, which are a pretty well known problem. You may, may have seen some slight political action around reducing human healthcare costs. So it's crazy that cats and dogs are getting sicker even faster and even more. And fundamentally, what we think everything comes down to is diet kibbles, canned foods that are currently on the market just are not delivering what they promise in terms of long-term health consequences. And it's not really confusing why. When you think about what people eat and what is good for us, it's minimally processed. It's ingredients that look like real food. And I don't think anybody who's ever opened a bag of kibble or a can of cat food has confused that with the nutritious, healthy food that they would want to feed themselves. Right, right. Yeah. So you're actually taking on a way of thinking. I mean, we've traditionally gone to, you know, our pet supply store or grocery store and purchased, you know, these canned items and the the kibble. And how is uh, feeding your cat changing based on your opinions and impressions? One of the biggest things that we do is, um, you know, if, if anybody has ever bought cat food, and I assume all of your listeners have, um, the feeding instructions on the side of a can or the side of a bag are very general and they're not really targeted in quite the right way. They can only say based on weight, maybe based on age if you're lucky, but there are a few other factors that are really important for figuring out how much a cat should eat. So one of the things we do at Smalls is when uh, customers sign up through our website, 
they give us some information about their cat's weight level. We show p- pictures of what sort of different bodies look like on the frame of a cat. And you then with that, you can let us know, if, is your cat overweight? Are they perfect? Are they a little underweight? With that information, with age and with weight, we give a specific calorie recommendation that we feed per day. And then we send that information to owners so they know exactly how much to be feeding. It's not good enough to say one cup when really the, me- the measurement we should be using is calories because that's the fundamental piece of what goes in turns into either you know energy and gets used appropriately or turns into fat and added weight. Right, right. And I'm one of the worst offenders, I must say, that I will put crunchies out for my cats, especially when I go on trips and stuff because then I feel guilty that... I'm going away. And what if my pet sitter doesn't come and feed my cats? Well, at least they've got, you know, some crunchies. And my understanding is, you know, like the crunchies really should be, if you have to feed crunchies, it's just a few at a time, not a whole bowl. Yeah. Dry food is problematic for a few different reasons. Obviously it's super convenient and and there's like just logistical reasons why dry food makes it easier for people. But there's two big problems with it. One, um, free feeding generally isn't isn't the best. Cats are natural predators, and so they're used to hunting and, and having long time without food on the table and, and then finding a prey and, and, and eating. So free feeding it really isn't in line with, with cats' natural behavior. Of course, you know, you go on vacation or you're out for the day or you have dinner plans and you want to have a bowl of food out so they're not hungry. Um, but cats can actually go without eating for quite a long time um, because they're natural predators. Um, And the other problem with dry food, and probably the more important one, is cats get most of their hydration from the moisture in their food. So just like humans are 70% water, so is fresh chicken. And so when cats are eating in the wild, the the prey that they eat is is actually mostly water. Um, And so that's just the way they're used to, to becoming hydrated. And so cats that eat dry food tend to be chronically dehydrated, which leads to all sorts of long term health impacts. Um, You hear a lot of times like, Oh, my fat, my cat's fine on kibble. But when you zoom out and you look at like the long term for that, yeah, it's fine for now. But, but is it having deteriorate effects uh, in the long term? And oftentimes it does. So some of the diseases that we face by feeding our cats kibble, dry food, dry, wet combinations, we're talking renal failure, we're talking obesity, we're talking urinary crystals. Um, As our cat population being indoor only, where we get older and older, I mean, that's just sort of the I can also probably put, would you put thyroid in there too? I mean, there's just a range of different things, skin allergies to different kinds of food reactions to all the miscellaneous stuff that's in food. There are just so many things in there. Can you tell me a little bit about maybe Calvin, what you're putting together to ensure that I mean, I just don't know who to trust. We read about like a raw food diet. We, I, I, if I wanted to change my cat's what would I do? Who would I trust? How could I do this? Absolutely. One other really fast, big health consequence that goes hand in hand with obesity is the resurgence of diabetes in cats also. Big, big thing that we're trying to work on. So we have sort of, I guess, two key tenets to what we think makes a healthy pet food. And they're really, really simple and easy to understand. And if you can follow this through with whatever you choose to feed, you'll be doing a lot better than, than most people. The first is moisture. As Matt was mentioning, cats get most of their moisture from food. Plenty of cats do drink water, but there's others who won't drink water until they're um, right on the verge of serious health consequences from dehydration. And the long-term impact of not drinking water is a big deal and not getting appropriate moisture from your food. So first off, look for something that's at least 60% moisture, ideally a little bit higher. And secondly, and this is the one that is nearest and dearest to our hearts in terms of what we're trying to change with our food, there should be abundant high quality protein. Cats are obligate carnivores and predators and what they are adapted to eat is mostly just meat. And then they get their trace nutrients from things like the stomachs of their prey. They'll often have small amounts of vegetables in that way from eating organ meat. And so what we do is we use all human quality meats. We get supplied by a restaurant supplier. And with that, all we do to our meats, and we use chicken, turkey, and beef, as well as beef liver, chicken liver, chicken gizzards, and chicken hearts in our various recipes. 
And all we ever do to them is either roast, saute, or simmer. So we, we try and do as little as possible to the meat. We just want to get it to a point of safety um, in terms of being cooked all the way through. And then we just grind it up and put it straight in the food. So we get it down to you know a healthy bite-sized piece. But we really focus on proteins that you immediately recognize. Our food looks like a ground meat salad. And we really think that's the key. We know that's the key to feeding cats well is just give them lots of high-quality protein. Yeah, And, and the, the protein is the the most expensive part, right? It's, it's the most expensive ingredient. So when you look at the protein percentages on these guaranteed analysis, oftentimes they're just too low. Um, you see like nine, 10% protein. We're up in 20 plus. So all of our recipes are, are over 20% protein, not by volume, by volume, they're 90% protein, but by guaranteed analysis. So it, it's really important that there's lots and lots of protein. And unfortunately, since that's the most expensive ingredient, um, the industry has sort of gone away from including enough of that. Um, but we think that cats getting enough protein and enough high quality protein to Calvin's point really makes a difference. And, and we've sort of just normalized too low because that's what's in the best interest for a lot of these companies. I didn't hear you mention fish. There's a very good reason for that. We, we try and stay away from fish. There's a couple reasons for it. Number one is the real, real difficulties in sourcing fish that is appropriate for cats. Um, there are a few sources out there that are good, but for the most part, tuna is being overfished like crazy. The ocean stocks are dwindling. Uh, when you look at farmed fish, it's really, really hard to find a source that doesn't feed questionable things, that doesn't end up with a co higher concentration of mercury than is safe. And at the end of the day, when we finally found um, a fish source that we were proud to serve, we realized we were going to be paying twice as much for that as we were for beef and four times as much as we were, were for chicken and decided not to try and pass those costs on to our customers and instead stick with more, I guess, healthy and consistently safe, both for the cats and for the environment, proteins like chicken, turkey, and beef. And also fish just isn't really a, a natural food source for cats. I mean, I think it's a bit of a myth that, I mean, cats do love it, so that certainly perpetuates <laughs> the myth that from like the cartoon world that, that cats are fish eaters, but in nature, cats are not really eating fish. So, you know, they love it and, and that myth gets perpetuated, but, but it's not really a core piece of, of the natural diet. And the other piece, I think Calvin was talking a little bit about sourcing. And if you look back, the New York Times actually covered a piece in 2015 of, of the sourcing practices for fish and, and a lot of fish that's affordable. And the reason that other suppliers can bring it in affordably is because it's using slave labor in the South China Sea. And so, you know, we don't, we don't need to like go into the whole, the whole deal on that, but we're trying to be ethical across the board and, and fish is just really tough to source ethically and, and to know your entire supply chain. So all of those things combined just made fish sort of a pass for us. Let's make helping cats in your community easier. Join me and over 10 exceptional leaders for the first ever online cat conference. This virtual conference will be held January 26th through 28th, 2018, and will feature speakers like Brian Cordes of Neighborhood Cats, Hannah Shaw, the Kitten Lady, Katie Lisnick of the Humane Society of the United States, Nell Thompson from Getting to Zero in Australia, and many, many more. This is an affordable opportunity to learn from nationally and internationally known leaders in the field of community cat management and care. To find out more details, please go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and sign up today to register. Fees go up on December 1st. Let's make helping cats easier in your community. Recently, I met the founders of Smalls, a Brooklyn-based company that makes human-grade food for cats. They gently cook the food just like you would at home to preserve all the nutrients and then ship it to you frozen. Their food is almost all super high quality meat with no fillers or grains of any sort and just a tiny bit of veggies for vitamins and minerals. As natural hunters and meat eaters, this is exactly the type of food cats need and actually quite similar to my ketogenic diet. I've signed up to try Smalls because I feel that my cats deserve real food that is easy to prepare. Many of you know that I am not a fan of spending time in the kitchen. If you want to see the difference real species appropriate food can make for yourself, go to smallsforsmalls.com and give it a try. You can get 50% off your first order. So go for it. Another thing that I see when I buy my cat food is there's a lot of brands of canned food out there. 
that have greens in them, greens or peas or carrots or a whole range of other things. You know, you know you've got your, your, your soup of the day mixture or whatever in the can. What are your thoughts with regards to that? I know you've talked about cats being primary protein eaters, but it seems like there's been this trend over the last 10 years or so of like sticking greenery in there, making it this like full meal type thing. For sure. The, the way we think about it, and I think the way that we, we really want to help convert every cat owner to looking at what they feed uh, is in terms of metabolizable energy. So the guaranteed analysis that you see on the side of a package will tell you the amount of pro- the percent of protein, the percent of fat, um, percent of carbs, fiber, and moisture. And there's a calculation you can do that takes that a step further and looks into where the energy actually comes from that goes to the cats in terms of calories. And so what we aim for in all of our recipes is keeping that percentage of their energy from carbohydrates under 5%. And there, there is some benefit to having vegetables in just in terms of being a good source of trace minerals. But for the most part, we would leave vegetables out entirely were it not an easier way to get in things that we would add via supplements otherwise. So our, our point of view basically is minimal vegetables, high level of protein, but vegetables are an acceptable source of some things like trace minerals and nutrients. You can get a lot of vitamins and I'm not going to run down the whole list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is okay if you see that in in the food. It's not like sort of like, oh, well, they're just putting that in there so that they don't have to put as much protein in there. It, it's just all about how much protein. I think we, we do have kale in some of our recipes and peas, but the fact of the matter is our recipes are almost all or all 90% plus the first ingredient on the list, which would be chicken, turkey, or beef, um, depending on the recipe. So we use them in very, very small quantities for those trace minerals. And I think it's kind of Going back to Calvin, what Calvin was saying about the gut and cats eating the gut of their prey, that's where they're getting those trace minerals. And we're sort of replicating that by including a very trace amount of, of veggies for um, the different vitamins and minerals. Good point. That's a great point. Excellent. So let's talk about Smalls. Let's, I mean, this is a brand new company, brand new venture. Matt, tell me what's going on with the business and, and specifically how is this going to work? Sure. Yeah. So we realize that fresh food makes makes a big difference and we wanted to figure out a way to bring home cooked quality food to people and the way we're doing that is is through an online business where you sign up for a meal plan like calvin said we ask you all the questions about your cats um, how much do they weigh what's their body type are they neutered how old are they etc and then we create a custom meal plan for you and then it's a subscription service so it's sent directly to you but i think the big change is that we don't have to deal with middlemen and we don't have to deal with shelf life um, all of our food is prepared fresh in brooklyn then we freeze it and and ship it to you so that's sort of the logistical end of the business and, and sort of what enables us to make a home cooked quality food and, and really much fresher food possible and in terms of, of where we are we are just a, about a month into having launched, really trying to get our first handful of customers in the door and, and start to sort of propagate this this shift in, in thinking around, around pet food um, and get people sort of challenging the status quo and trying to think about what, what food really means to their pets. I think, you know, we see that trend in, in human food and, and we don't think it's very a big stretch really to, to get people thinking about the health consequences of, of food for, for their cats. It would be fantastic if you partnered with some of the, uh, the people meal plan. I mean, we're now pretty used to the, the regular, you know, people food meal plans that deliver. There's, you know, multiple names out there where you can order your regular weekly delivery of food. I think people are pretty comfortable with that system now. So this sounds great. Yeah, people definitely are getting used to getting food delivered. Fortunately, our food is, is all comes pre-prepared. So there's no cooking involved. Although I think some people might be down to to get it sort of the ingredients and then cook it for themselves. We're actually doing some cooking classes for folks who are interested in learning about the processes of actually making it and, and sort of seeing the process start to finish. And, and I think the industry has a bit of a problem with transparency and, and being honest about where their ingredients are coming from, how they prepare the food and, and sort of what goes into it. And so we're trying to flip that on its head a little bit and invite people to our kitchen, show them the entire process and at the same time teach them about how they can potentially cook 
our recipes for for their cats at home. Yeah, we're the self-destructive kind of business people where on a, our, our ideal outcome would be everybody home cooking. We know it's kind of unrealistic and people don't have the time to do it in a lot of cases, which is why we're selling food instead of just evangelizing about the benefits of home cooking. But frankly, like, the best thing you could possibly do is cook for your cat at home. It's just hard to get everything right. And one of the advantages of buying from us. And what we've done is, you know, we have exhaustively researched the nutritional profiles needed. Getting in those trace minerals and vitamins is really, really hard to do at home. But ultimately that home cooked food is just so much better than anything that's stuffed with preservatives that's made through complex cooking processes and what ends up basically on grocery store shelves. Yeah. And if you look at our process, it's not very dissimilar from what you would see at a home kitchen. We have a bigger oven than you do, but we use the oven just the same. We have a bigger mixer than you do at home, but it's the same process. So really we are home cooked food just at a slightly larger scale. We don't have a mega factory producing things. Everything is cooked with our hands and boiled with our hands and chopped with our hands. So really we're trying our best to replicate what home cooked food is and, and get that to people. So with that, that cooking theme, we are approaching Thanksgiving and um, there's always food on the table, all kinds of good food, bad food, and in between. Do you have any thoughts or ideas or recommendations of, of what we should do with our cats around Thanksgiving? Is it okay for us to feed them some treats or feed them some turkey? Um, any any thoughts around that? We, we hate to be party poopers, um, but <laughs> our recommendation is to avoid table scraps. And there are two main reasons for that. The first is that things like onions and garlic are toxic to cats. And all the best human food has onions and garlic. And it can be really hard to remember as, you know, you're passing a a little piece of turkey down that that might have toxic elements to it. But it can actually lead to some pretty devastating um, health consequences, depletion of red blood cells among cats. The second reason is that cats are very, very habit forming. And if you get them used to table scraps, you sort of take them out of a natural diet and consistent flow. And as we were talking about earlier, the thing we think is that's most important for cats is regulating their caloric intake in a lot of ways. And adding table scraps to the mix makes it almost impossible to regulate how much they're eating. Well, that answers that question for all of us. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but I, I totally understand. We can't resist either. We'll we're, we'll occasionally pass pass a little food down, but It's one of those things, go go in knowing that there are some risks, be very careful about uh, what's in the food that you're sharing and try and avoid it. But no, I I I wouldn't be so mad at if at, you know, big family gatherings, your Thanksgivings, your, your holiday parties, it's okay to share a little bit. Just don't get too used to it. Don't get too crazy. Or you can just give them a catnip toy and have them enjoy that while everybody else is partying away. Might might be better than some kibble though. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) So if folks are interested in finding out more about Smalls, um, Matt, how would they sign up for this program? Yeah, so you can check us out at smallsforsmalls.com. We have a one-week trial. We know cats can be a little bit picky. They can be tough customers to please. So we have 50% off um, your first week of food. So you can get it pretty low cost to see how your cats go for it, see what that process is like, and, and make sure you like what you're getting. And then... After that, yeah, you're signed up for for a meal plan. And um, as much as we are against kibble, we recognize that it's a a real part of the logistical hurdles of of pet ownership. And so we have different meal plans that allow you to have some of smalls or or half smalls. So you can still mix it in with other food. But, you know, just like human food, you know, the more healthy food you can eat. So it's not it's not that you have to go full bore and and only feed, you know, home cooked quality food. You can you can mix it in with the rest of of what you have going on. Um, but yeah, you can check us out online at smallsforsmalls.com. And I would think you probably would have some tips on on how to adapt your cat to a new food because I know sometimes it's hard changing a cat's food, so you might have to do it sort of slowly too. Absolutely. Yeah, we we include in everybody's first box, we have a transition guide that sort of helps talk people through the approach to transitioning, how to think about that process. We offer text support. So we, you know, we send you our phone number. We really, really want people to text us whenever they're having troubles transitioning. Then we, we do a few things to kind of cheat. We send packets of chicken liver powder as well as packets of bonito flakes in that first order. And sprinkling either of those on top of our food as you help transition 
is a great way to signal to your cat that this is food, get them to take their first couple bites and then help them learn to switch their diets over. Yeah. I think so, so cats are neophiles and neophobes, which means that they both like novelty, but they are afraid of new, new things. So transitioning can be tricky for some cats for sure, but a lot of it just comes down to persistence and not getting frustrated and taking your time, making sure your cat has time to uh, be exposed to the new food. Sometimes we have stories of people sort of leaving the food out next to the new food. The cat won't even touch the touch smalls and keep eating its old food, but the presence and the scent of that food around the eating helps and over time they transition. So it's really it's really about the humans, less about the cats or the parent. And you know best, your cat doesn't know that it needs to be eating healthier food. And so it's, it's really more about getting humans on board with being patient and being persistent, just taking time with it. And, and some cats transition immediately and some cats transition over the course of months, but it's, it's always doable and, and it's always possible. That's great. Is there anything else that uh, either Matt or Kelvin, either one of you would like to share with our listeners? Uh, one thing we didn't get to talk about was vets and, and sort of talking about the education system um, that goes into pet food recommendations and what's going on on that. I think everyone has really great intentions, but um, just like human doctors, vets don't get the best training in nutrition. So we get a lot of people coming to us saying, oh, my vet recommended this or my vet recommended that, especially around prescription diets, which is a whole other conversation. And so I guess we, we would just want to challenge people to, to sort of understand that, that vets don't always get the best education around nutrition. Actually, what happens in a lot of cases is that folks from some of these big pet food manufacturers will play a big role in, in educating vets about pet food recommendations, um, which obviously has some incentive problems and isn't necessarily unbiased. So, And that's not at all to say that vets don't have the best intentions. I mean, they dedicated their careers to pet health, so it's really more of a systemic issue than it is an accusation against vets. But we just want to let people know that vets don't always necessarily know what's going on with with nutrition. And so relying on them too heavily or, or not being willing to challenge the recommendation is, is something that should change. And, and people should know that, you know, when, when they go about thinking about food choices, the vets might not always know what's going on. Yeah. A, a favorite example we like to throw out. One thing a lot of cat owners have heard and actually a lot of vets share as well is the idea that kibble is beneficial for dental health. And I just push people to think about, imagine telling your kid that they should eat potato chips to knock plaque off of their teeth. And that's the same thought process as kibble being good for plaque control. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Nevertheless, this myth has been repeated over and over again. We've heard from tons of people that that's why their vet tells them to use dry food. And it's just simply not true. And as Matt was mentioning, this is the result of questionable education around nutrition. The fact of the matter is a lot of vets throughout their education get as little as three weeks of training in one class on nutrition, which just isn't enough for this central, central issue related to animal health. It's so true. So true with our human doctors too. I mean, it's, I would advocate anybody question what nutritional recommendations a human doctor gives you too. It's in certain situations. Also, it's, we have to be our own advocates and we have to do our own research. So I think that that's very, very true. Matt, Calvin, I want to thank you both so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show today. And I'm already envisioning a Community Cats podcast cooking show in the future. You should do it. Would love to do that. Thank you both. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. This is great. Thank you for listening to a Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more Community Cats. 